Remind members about the protocols regarding the use of electronic devices. Can I advise those in the public gallery that mobile devices may be used through a Wi-Fi connection and all devices should be muted? Password details are set out in the gallery rules for anyone wanting to connect to the Assembly's Wi-Fi network. 3G and 4G should not be used and no recordings or photographs are to be taken. So apologies. Have we received any apologies today? Are members aware of any apologies? I think we have full attendance anyway. So in terms of Chairman's business, the Deputy Chair and I met on last Thursday with Haemophilia NA and friends and families of Haemophilia. Members will recall that £1 million was allocated by the Minister of Finance in January towards financial support for those affected by contaminated blood products. And the Department assured us here at committee that the full sum would be dispersed by the end of the financial year, with a further £1 million to be sought for the coming financial year. The families that we met with have raised serious questions about the handling of this matter, including delays and a lack of engagement with them. Given that it is six weeks until the end of the financial year, if members are content, I think the quickest way to follow up would be to write to the Department to inquire about the process and timeline for allocating these funds. A draft letter is included in the table papers at page four. Are members content? <coughs> Thank you. I represented the committee uh, this week and spoke at the Gambling with Lives event on Tuesday, sponsored by Paula. I know some of you also attended. Members may have heard some of the media coverage of the increased risk of suicide among gambling addicts as compared with other addicts and the lack of dedicated health care services and indeed the lack of uh, educational focus on, on the issue of problem gambling. Uh, members, I suggest that we consider gambling addiction as part of our scrutiny of mental health and implementation of the suicide strategy within Protect Life 2. Would you be content with that? Mm -hmm. yeah. I also attended a meeting yesterday in Lisbon and spoke at it briefly in relation to parenting and NI and uh, just in relation to inequalities and concerns. Actually, quite a bit of overlap in terms of worries around young people accessing online gambling. Um, dealing with technology, parents just, just concerned about technology and uncertain future. Brexit actually was, was mentioned as well as part of the research, where people just feel uncertain about how things are, precarious work, childcare arrangements and things like that. So I think it is, it is certainly an interesting area and one which we will no doubt come to at, at some stage. I was also speaking to some in, in relation to family mediation and good practice in terms of early intervention with, with issues. So, uh, I don't, uh, that, that's all I have in terms of that meetings this week. So I now refer you to the draft minutes of the meeting held on the 13th of February, which are pages 6 to 11 of the meeting pack. Are members content with the minutes? Yes. Thank you. Uh, can I advise members there are no matters arising from the minutes at this point? So now, briefing from the Royal College of General Practitioners and the British Medical Association. Can I advise members that representatives from the RCGP and the BMA are here today to brief the committee on current issues in the health service with regard to transformation and workforce. And I know you will all probably have engaged with, with both organisations at various times, so I think we're, we're happy to say that we're all pleased to have the opportunity to hear from them today. So can I welcome Mr. Tom Black, Chair of the BMA, <coughs> and Dr. Lawrence Dorman, Dr. Tom Black and Dr. Lawrence Dorman, Chair of RCGP. So if you want to go ahead, gentlemen, and brief the committee, please. Thank you. So thank you very much. Um, general practice is the, is the bedrock of the health service, and GPs take enormous pride in being not only a good doctor, but somebody's doctor. General practice deals with the majority of patient contacts, and it's highly valued and trusted by our patients. <coughs> but our services are under significant pressure. Seven reviews of our health service over the past two decades have advocated for change, and we as GPs are keen to play our part in this change. Many of these have advocated for things like shift of patient care to communities, but unfortunately we have felt the resources for this and the capacity to increase our services have not followed. Our pressures can be summarised by three Ws, our workload, our workforce and our workplace or our premises. So our workforce, our, the population of, of our society is increasing both in numbers but also significantly in complexity. 
multimorbidity is rising. Multimorbidity is a condition is whenever a patient suffers from several long-term conditions. So patients may well suffer not only from things like blood pressure, but diabetes and heart disease, making it much more complex. What this requires is an expert medical generalist to manage those conditions which are important to the patient and to manage the complexity of the medications that invariably follows. We are seeing in general practice an increasing number of chronic conditions which we are managing, such as diabetes and asthma and COPD, and these are things that previously would have been managed in hospitals. As we look to the future, we feel that these conditions and this number and range of complexity is likely to increase. In 2006-2007, there were 363 practices. This has fallen to 327 by September 2019. This is due to either closures or mergers, but associated with this is an increase in the number of registered patients per practice by 11%. This has led to potential long waits for patients uh, for up to weeks for appointments, which we feel is unacceptable, and it is bad not only for the health of the patient, but bad for the mental well-being of our GP workforce. <coughs> Our workforce. So, a recent Comrades uh, survey done of the Royal College of GPs last year found that 26% of GPs felt they were unlikely to be working in general practice in the next five years. We know that we have demographics which support this, which show that 25% of our population, our GP population, are 55 years and over. And with pension rules as they are, we fear that they will leave suddenly, uh, leaving our profession. We are having uh, recruitment difficulties, and we are aware of significant uh, difficulties in recruiting, particularly to the west of the country and the southwest of the country. Rurality, in particular, finds difficult. We are working actively to try and, and improve this, and we have an advanced paper at the moment to, to discuss how we could improve cross-border working, and particularly to enable uh, GPs from the Republic of Ireland to work in Northern Ireland. Our workplace or our premises. M many of our colleagues are, are finding difficulty performing basic functions and basic GP services out of the premises. Uh, recently, we have welcomed in practice-based pharmacists, and they have been a, an invaluable resource. Uh, but unfortunately, rooms are getting tight. The new proposal of MDTs faces, gives us huge challenges. Uh, we're hugely supportive of this model, but physically finding space for these new workers is, is going to be difficult. We also have a new challenge in that the Queen's University medical curriculum will change from this September and the new curriculum will be called C25. Uh, C for curriculum 25 is in 2025 when the first graduates will, will, will come out. <coughs> this will train all doctors and not just GPs. And GPs look forward and we relish the, the prospect of training these new doctors. We will be training the new cardiologists of tomorrow as well as we hope uh, showing what, what general practice can, can offer. 25% of this training is going to come through general practice, putting huge uh, strains on our, our physical, structural workplace uh, requirements. Um, <clears throat> so analysis, we, we would urge that analysis of all G premises is, is urgently needed, and particularly uh, with, uh, with the in introduction of this new MDT model. The new model uh, and of, of multidisciplinary teams uh, was at the centre of the transformation argument, and, and we were keen to be part of the discussions about this. We welcome the fact that, that the MDT model received such prominence in the new decade new approach, but we do have con some concerns. One of the initial concerns we have is at the rate of pace of change. Uh, the new decade new approach model suggested that 100,000 patients in the first year uh, should come under the should, new patients should come under the new MDT model. We feel at the moment there are five federations covering approximately 630 patients, and if this rate of change of, of 100,000 per year, this could risk MDTs not being ruled out fully for another 12 <coughs> years. We would encourage that, keeping with the vision of, of delivering together 2026, that, that MDTs could be uh, funded and in place uh, by that time. One of the things that, that we worry about whenever we speak to our GP colleagues is, is when they say they feel they'll be retired by the time they see this urgent resource coming into place. If our, we're going to potentially lose 25% of our workforce in five years, that could be very destabilizing and will make it very difficult to introduce a new resource if a practice is, is under pressure and a practice is destabilized. What we feel would be helpful, however, would be a timetable. If a GP maybe says, I don't think I'll get an MDT by the time I'm retired, it may be helpful to tell them that in three years' time or in four years' time, this resource is coming to them. It will allow <coughs> long-term planning, it will allow uh, planning for, work for workplace premises and things, and also the, the way of thinking. Uh, what we worry about is if GPs switch off from this way of working, because it is going to take a big change. It's going to be a, a huge change of how, how we all work. 
Uh, we, we welcome the MDT model, and we're very keen th uh, that, that it comes in because we feel it will give very good service for our patients. Patients will not have to wait as long for services such as uh, direct contact services such as physiotherapy and mental health and social work. And we see the huge potential that these services could have for, for preventative work and working upstream. Uh, social work and mental health work could proactively see patients who have long-term mental health issues or social problems uh, which affect the, the social determinants of health, and we see this model as, a, as an excellent way of doing it. There are, however, difficulties with it, but we are keen to work positively uh, to, to implement this model. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Dr. Durham and Dr. Black. Good morning, everyone, and thank you, Chair, for giving BMA Northern Ireland the opportunity to come before the committee today to give evidence on the transformation agenda and the workforce strategy. BMA is a trade union and a professional association, and we represent medical students and all doctors, delivering care to patients in both primary and secondary care across all specialties in Northern Ireland. We are all aware of the unacceptably long waiting times being faced by patients, both for elective care and, more recently, for red flag urgent care. <clears throat> the situation has become particularly worse in the last year with regard to waiting times for patients being referred urgently from general practice into secondary care. We should be able to guarantee a service for all of these patients where time is critical, the best outcomes being achieved. And at the moment, we cannot always deliver this to all patients, and that's a bad situation for the health service in Northern Ireland to be in. The transformation of the health and social care service needs to happen urgently. We've had the Ben Gore review, we've delivering together documents as guidelines with commitments for change. All recent reviews have recommended a move away from services being delivered in hospitals to community care delivered closer to patients' homes. <clears throat> we have made some progress in this regard. A significant achievement in transformation has been pharmacists based in general practice and now the development of multidisciplinary teams. We are getting first contact physiotherapists, social workers, mental health workers working alongside existing teams to provide enhanced care to health and social care services within a primary care setting. MDTs will also have enhanced numbers of health visitors and district nurses, allowing them to spend more time with patients. These are currently operating, as Dr. Dorman has said, in five areas, one in each trust, and it's been rolled out with developments based on the 17 GP federations, which were developed over the last five years. GPs themselves developed and funded these federations initially and devised a model which has allowed the multidisciplinary teams to be implemented. So well done to the GPs in that. <laughs> so some very welcome progress and transformation has been made in partnership with general practice. However, it is well documented that our ED departments are struggling to meet the needs of our growing, frail, elderly population. For many frail elderly people, the last thing they want to do is sit in ED for long periods of time. Yet that's the situation many people find themselves in. Further work is needed in transforming that aspect of our service. Transformation needs to find a smoother path between primary and secondary care services if whole service transformation is to happen. To achieve the transition to delivery of services from secondary care to the primary care setting, much more support is needed to keep practices open and to encourage doctors into general practice. Three things underpin the delivery of the health and care service in Northern Ireland, the workload, the workforce and the funding. Transformation has to consider all these in order to achieve its aims of a world-class service. We also need to keep in mind what would the service look like if the Delivering Together Transformation vision was fully implemented? What would change for patients and carers, and what would change for doctors? In the difficult position patients find themselves in, it, it, it can be hard to visualise an end goal, but the leaders of the system and the political leaders need to keep sight of this to really achieve change. 
turning to the medical workforce. BMA represents more than 6,000 doctors and medical students in Northern Ireland. Over the last three years, we have been gathering the view, their views on issues affecting them in Northern Ireland. They are working in a pressurised environment. There has been a drop in the number of doctors in training going on to specialty training programmes in recent years. This has, this has contributed to the number of doctors working as locums compared with previous years. We have been working closely with our junior doctor members to find out what their concerns are. In a member survey, 40% of them said they would not recommend Northern Ireland as a place to undertake medical training, and over a third of junior doctors reported low morale. Issues included difficulty taking study leave due to rota caps and workload, receiving rotas at short notice, and regularly working more than their rostered hours. BMA has raised these findings with employers and the department, and some progress is being made, but it needs to be prioritised if Northern Ireland is to be the attractive place for doctors to train, work and live. <coughs> BMA in Northern Ireland lobbied for a single lead employer for doctors in training, and this was included in the Health and Social Care Workforce Strategy launched in 2018. If single lead, the single lead employer, if effectively implemented, will address a number of practical issues, such as doctors having to effectively change employer every six months. All doctors in training are due to move to the single lead employer by this August. Resources and support for the rollout of this model need to be maintained. <coughs> a second medical school at McGee must be urgently actioned to improve medical recruitment and retention, especially in general practice. The need for more medical school places was recognised in the Gardner Review this time last year. The same review also estimates that due to people living longer and increased demand on the health service, there will need to be a 50 per cent increase in the number of consultants over the next 15 years meaning that an additional 1,000 more consultants will need to be in place in Northern Ireland by 2033. So we need the medical school places to bring the students through so that we have the doctors for the future. BMA Northern Ireland gave evidence to the committee in 2015 where we highlighted the crisis in general practice and warned that unless immediate action was taken, this workforce crisis would seep into secondary care. Unfortunately, that is exactly what we are now experiencing. In a BMA member survey, over 70 per cent of consultants have described their morale as low or very low. The impact of pensions taxation on doctors is resulting in doctors in Northern Ireland reducing their clinical commitments. Northern Ireland remains the only part of the United Kingdom where the government has not implemented any mitigation for these pension taxation problems. The need for cultural change in Northern Ireland, health and social care, should also be a central part of the transformation. BMA members reported significant concerns about HSC culture, with 56 per cent of them, 56 per cent of the doctors, <coughs> being, <coughs> being unfairly blamed for errors, and half saying that they work in a blame culture, where they, which they believe contributes to difficulties in retaining staff. Doctors here must be able to work in a positive environment with a learning culture where they feel they are being treated fairly and equally with their UK and Republic of Ireland counterparts. Workforce issues are front and centre to the transformation progress and the implementation of the workforce strategy must be given a higher priority and be adequately resourced to prevent further delays. The workforce strategy's central aim is to develop and sustainably fund an optimum workforce model for reconfigured health and social care services. This highlights the link between workforce and the transformation programme. Steps linked with transforming services, such as the appointment of a specialist and associate specialist associate dean, otherwise known as a SAS associate dean, 
would contribute to improvements. This appointment has now been delayed for a significant time and needs to be progressed. <coughs> the importance of health and social care staff in delivering high quality, effective and safe services must be recognised. Cutting staff terms and conditions to make savings is counterproductive and unacceptable. HSC staff must feel valued and pay party with the rest of UK nations must be part of this. An area of the strategy which needs to be prioritised is the development of comprehensive wellbeing and occupational health service for staff across HSC. Actions to ensure safe staffing across all healthcare professional groups needs to be prioritised. Safe staffing will place obligations on service providers to ensure that they have adequate staff to deliver a service safely and also need to include effective workforce planning reporting. The HSC workforce strategy highlights the need for better workforce data and staff, safe staffing gives another driver to improve this from where it is at present. BMA in Northern Ireland is very much committed to assisting the Minister and the Department to ensure that the service for patients is safe, accessible and high quality. Our members want to work within a transformed service which is sustainable so that patients can receive the timely care they need and deserve. Thank you once again for the opportunity to come before the committee. I'm happy to take questions this time. Thank you, Dr Black. Um, I suppose one of the things that occurred to me as in, in uh, Dr Darman's presentation was the issue of cross-border working and seeking further for their work cross-border. Do you have concerns that the uncertainty around Brexit or <coughs> indeed some of the certainties around Brexit will lead to further difficulties in terms of mutual recognition of qualifications or <coughs> pay issues? Or how, how is Brexit impacting on that work? So, so it's the uncertainty issue is, is the big problem with Brexit. Nobody actually knows. And while things are quiet at the moment, we anticipate a big rush come November this year about what's going to happen. What, what, we, what we are keen about is, is the equivalence of, of recognition of qualifications. Uh, at the moment, the Republic of Ireland will be considered as international, and they will be considered under the same vein as an Australian <coughs> doctor or somebody like that. But we see that, that these, this class is, is, or this group of doctors are clearly different. Their primary language is English. Uh, their training and Royal College has worked with, with other people to, to look at their, their qualifications, which we feel are on par with their own, uh, and also that they are used to a, treating a similar demographic of, of patients. So it's not the same as an Australian doctor who's used to treating a, a cohort of patients from Australia. I mean, they're already treating a very similar demographic here. So we have an advance paper which, which we, we feel we could, we could work with. I think it's a good point, Chair. There's a lot of services cross-border too. We all know about the paediatric cardiac mm -hmm. uh, surgery in Dublin, but there's cross-border GP out of ours across the west and the south and border areas. We have uh, cancer and cardiac services coming in. Uh, to Alton Galvin. There's a lot of work goes on cross border, so it's it's all about people, patients getting across, the services being continued, the staff being recognised, and there's also some issues around Brexit with the supply of medicines and uh, radioisotopes is a is the key one that we've talked about in the past. So a lot of concern, as Dr. Dorman says, and hopefully uh, all the details will be smoothed out so that things will run as they are now. And in terms of the serious problems there's been, particularly with the ban, large parts of Man and Tyrone with uh, GP closures, amalgamations, the pressure being put on to the remaining GPs, how important is the McGee Medical School that that, that is caught up and run in a timely fashion, in particular in the West, but across services more generally? Uh, the most dire need, and I know two of the members are here from Fermanagh, uh, is in Fermanagh. And that has surprised me, to be quite frank. But as Lauren said earlier, it's rurality and deprivation mm -hmm. are the two big problems. So I know, Jerry, you'll be thinking, yeah, Belfast is in this problem too. Look at North Belfast and a couple of, and that's true as well. So it's deprivation and rurality. When you're providing a service which is under pressure, where the staff are really stressed, they will, the younger members will quite naturally look to see, is there a job I can take where I won't be burnt out? 
and there's obviously an internal competition now within the BMA to see who can be the most stressed and the most burnt out, and it's been won by ED and GPs, and that doesn't surprise us because uh, and it's an interesting concept for you. ED is a primary care service. It's in a hospital behind the big red bricks, but it's a primary care service. It's the primary care right at the front line. So the second medical school, if we don't have the second medical school within this year, next year, uh, in 10 years' time, this committee will be talking about busing people up to the east of Northern Ireland to see a GP. You'll be seeing a nurse in Fermanagh and then hopefully a GP in Craig Alvin if you're lucky. And that's the situation that we're moving forward to. And we have an excellent uh, medical school at Queen's University, graduate of Queen's, I'm afraid I'm UCD. 93% of the output of Queen's University in the last 20 years who became a GP, 93% in the last 20 years live within 10 miles of Queen's. There's like a big magnet in Queen's and they can't escape it, Jerry. I don't know what it is in Belfast, <laughs> but they can't seem to get out. And we've a, a in fact, it's on the Northern Ireland Assembly uh, website. There's a there's a map that shows how far you have to go to see your GP, and it's basically the northwest, the west, and the southwest. You just travel a long distance to see your GP without a second medical school. Um, we're we're in very deep trouble. Thank you. And finally, from me. Um in relation to workforce issues, and there are huge gaps in, in core, in, in nursing posts and all of that, but separate and alongside of that, there are also huge issues around all grades working to the top of their band and the top of their ability. In light of yesterday's news that there will be a limit set, a, a cap set on, on pay, is there a concern that admin staff, maybe back office staff will be harder to get, and, and maybe also in terms of domiciliary care workers, that that will have an impact on, on uh, future work in terms of dealing with the workforce issues? Yeah, I, I can see this. Uh, when you're a GP in the bog side in Derry, uh, a lot of your staff come across from the other side of the border. Does, does that get affected with Brexit? Uh, I think that uh, we need to have a, an open society where we're happy to bring workers in. And I think that that wasn't possible <laughs> yesterday, but that's London politics, isn't it? OK, I have uh, Alex indicating first. Alex, then Pam, then Paul, and then have a few others. Put that in that order initially. Thank you, Chair. Thank you for your presentation. Um, could we don't mind me asking you a quick question? <laughs> um, historically, what has changed in terms of GPs in the past willing to go right to GP practices outside of Belfast and there didn't seem to be an issue, although there could well have been, I am not aware of that. And now, w w why do they not want to go outside of Belfast? That's my first question. Second question is retirement of GPs. Um, how many GPs do we have at the moment and how many do we need? And why are they all retiring in such a block? Now, um, was this not envisaged in the past, and um, why hasn't that been dealt with, and who hasn't been dealing with it? I'm not saying you, by the way. But. Okay. So, so the, the first question about it is, is a supply and demand one, like I allude to. You know, a, a GP, a graduating GP at the moment, can choose where he or she would like to work, uh, and so a lot of younger GPs it is more attractive to, to stay close to the city whether that's due to as Tom says about you know graduating from Queen's or not but they have a choice of, of where they like to work and so on so that is one of the big reasons why why they stay close to to big centres and so on and, and this I don't mean to call it a threat but but the more perceived difficult job of a rural practice or or a practice in a deprived area is, is not as attractive so that that's why it's and there's not that there is the, the numbers coming behind to support that uh, in terms of why have we got here so as I said before, all, all the reviews of our health service have said more services need to come into general practice. Uh, Transforming Your Care famously talked about shifting left, but didn't put in any provision for an extra GP. And it's only in 2016 that the number of training places went up to 111. <coughs> Uh, while we welcome that increase to 111, it has been very difficult to fill those places. And one of the big reasons is, is the workload just looks too insurmountable for a lot of GPs. Um, so there, there are two reasons, and the workload and the work, the workforce are, are, are linked. Okay. Thank you. Um, Pam? Yes, and thank you for your um, presentation. 
Uh, it's pretty scary, those um, statistics in the Comrades um, survey. 26% of those surveyed are, likely, are unlikely to be working in general practice in five years' time. 32% of GPs said at least once a week they felt so stressed they couldn't cope. Um, it, and even the, the last one there, the 42% of GPs said that they, that they felt it was not very or not at all financially sustainable to run a GP practice in Northern Ireland. Can you give us any more information on um, kind of what's going on here? And, and in particular, that 42% of GP said it, it, you know, felt it wasn't financially sustainable to run a practice. What's what is going on there? What are the what are the key issues that, that are making that they feel it's not sustainable? So, so practices are small businesses, yeah. uh, and and we have to get that balance right between how many staff we employ, whether that's at what rate we have to employ them at our premises and all sorts of things. So, so there are huge variable factors that will take into account of that. The, the main thing is, is, the work, is the workforce, is whether we have GPs to meet the demand. Uh, and I think that most practices would cite that that is the, the major thing that makes a practice uh, sustainable or viable. Uh, many of our members are struggling so much to get uh, cover, locum <coughs> cover, to, to back them up. That In my own area, we've had two GPs who haven't had holidays for two years, uh, and that's not sustainable over the long term. Um, so so it, it comes back to the shortage of the workforce again. Um, could I give you an insight here? Um, everything's workload at the end of the day. We'll talk about funding and we'll talk about workforce and we'll talk about training and everything else. But at the back of it all is workload. And when you look at the workload GPs are doing now, Alex, compared to 20 years ago, it's double. So the number of consultations, the number of prescriptions, the number of referrals, the number of everything has doubled. The average GP will be sitting looking at 35 to 40 consultations per day, 200 prescriptions per day, 50 or 60 blood results, 50 or 60 hospital letters, which are really long and complicated, and you've got to read them all and then action them all. And that doesn't include all the other stuff that I haven't mentioned of linking in with staff. And you think to yourself, that's impossible. You've got to develop shortcuts. To be confident to develop shortcuts, you've got to be experienced. And imagine coming in to that job as a young doctor, it, is, it would in, inspire fear and concern, and that's what it is at the back of it all. Now, you might say to us, why is all this extra workload? And of course, it's because the health service is an unusual uh, industry, and in that the more successful we are, the more work we make yeah. for ourselves. So it's not unusual now to see 94-year-olds going into hospital and being helped and been brought out again just to go back in again next year and that's a good thing clearly the number of 85 and over will increase by what 40 percent in the next decade or so so we are a victim of our own success in keeping people alive longer we now have more old people with more diseases requiring more drugs more investigations more referrals more consultations and the number of gps hasn't been increased to match that because chair everybody the last 25, 30 years that I've been doing this has talked about shift left and moving resources into primary care. It never happens. Mm -hmm. When I was a young doctor, there were double, maybe treble the number of GPs compared to consultants. There are now more consultants than our GPs. And you think, yeah, that's because we want our patients to go into hospital behind the red bricks and be seen by the consultants. No, we want them to stay in the community, but we put all the resource and all the workers in behind the red bricks. A quick anecdote. GPs love anecdotes. Um, I have a 94-year-old patient I'm trying to get out of hospital. Needs physiotherapy for rehabilitation. The 94-year-old patient, uh, the family are very keen to get that patient into the nursing home. Bed waiting, bed there, and but can't because the waiting list in the community for physiotherapy is 12 weeks. I kid you not. So put the resources where you want the patients to be would be our simple message today. I think, yeah. yeah. Thank you. Appreciate that. I mean, we love, we love uh, short, short anecdotes ourselves. Yeah, <laughs> um, yeah I, th I totally get where you're coming from there. Tell me this. Um, in terms of the amount of patients presenting on a daily basis to the doctor's surgery, do you have any uh, breakdown in terms of percentage-wise of how many maybe didn't need to come necessarily to a GP that could have gone to pharmacy. And I know that's, I know that that's kind of iffy because at the end of the day, as you say, you become a victim of your own success. You want people to, 
you know, come and regularly to the yeah, GP okay. and uh, no, but, yeah, well, but obviously we're all fond of early intervention and all the rest of it, but are there, uh, are there a number of people who are presenting to the GP, uh, same as you would the ED, maybe unnecessarily or where there would be a better place for them and, and all that as well? I mean, you mentioned pharmacy within the GP practices, but are we talking about physical pharmacies present to dispense or are we talking about a full service where actually pharmacists are <coughs> consulting yeah. so, and so, advising? So, so that's a good question and it's actually one that GPs have, have struggled with themselves because there's two different concepts there, okay? So there's task substitution and role substitution. So while it's okay for me to delegate some of my tasks, my simpler tasks, such as if a patient has a, a simple bad back or a sore throat, it is okay for me to delegate some of those less risky tasks to another member of staff, like a physiotherapist. But the role substitution we can't, we can't get rid of. So beforehand, GPs were like uh, very good uh, flute players or orchestra players, whereas now they're more conductors of an orchestra. They're leading a team yeah. of people within them. And that's really important because we need to use... GPs are... It's, it's an interesting concept, expert medical generalists. We are good at a lot of different things. Uh, so we are expert generalists, which sounds like a, a misnomer, but, but that's where our services need to be. And we need to be stepping back a little bit from the really busy bit and, and, and leading the team so that the more complicated patients we can deal with and have longer for it, so we can have more time to care. Uh, and what we've argued for a long time in general practice is that w we have a 10-minute consultation model, which is no longer fit for purpose. It, it would needs to extend to 15 minutes, particularly when people are more elderly, they have more mobility problems, uh, and their c conditions are more, are more complex. So we, we're, we're urging for time to care. But it's OK to delegate some of those tasks to, like I say, these members of the MDT. So if somebody has maybe a low, you know, uh, low mood or low-grade low depression, you know, low, uh, they can go to a, a mental health worker, but also go for first time. Uh, and GPs are not proud. I mean, I am not not proud to allow somebody to go to a physiotherapist first time who will have much more skills and expertise than I will have mm -hmm. on, on the management of, of back pain and so on. It's, it's the right person, and they can get them quicker. And also, if they do intervene quicker, they stop them getting more complex, they stop the pain getting worse, and they improve mobility and so on, and all the associations with that. So that was the first question. The next one then was about the practice-based pharmacists. So they've been expert, um, excellent members of our teams. They have been employed and recruited uh, by our federations, which we feel has been an excellent model, and the federations have proved extremely adept at doing so. Uh, what we like about the model is that they adapt to our practice teams very well. Uh, each practice is slightly different because a practice in North Belfast will be slightly different to my practice down in Kilkeel, uh, and our demographics will need different things. So some practice-based pharmacists have training in respiratory conditions and can do asthma checks and things like that, whereas other practice-based pharmacists can do diabetes checks and things like that, and it's, it's moulding where, where that need is greatest. What we do see, and I mean Tom said, is that the amount of prescriptions and drugs that we are dealing with in general practice has risen dramatically. Uh, repeat prescriptions has increased by 40 between 2003 to 2013 uh, and each of those is a risk each of those prescriptions is a genuine risk so at the moment in, the <coughs> in hospital care on the wards pharmacists patrol the wards and, and no junior doctor dares write in a cardex without a, a pharmacist over their shoulder checking what they've been doing at the moment in general practice the risk for error there is too great and we have needed these these extra team members to come into our practices so it's been a fantastic resource okay. Okay, thank you um, I have two, two separate, very different um, questions. The first one, um, Dr. Black, you, you talked about the blame culture, and I'm just wondering how much you are linking into the Department of Health's um, hyponatremia work stream, looking at duty of candor. So I'd like to see if you have any comments on that on the, when we think then about what's coming out of the Dr. Watt neurology inquiry and Muckamore and other ways in which we feel that there's maybe just a, a, a degree of secrecy. Yeah. in some areas. So we'd just like to have your positions on the emerging work on Judith Kander. Those instances that you mentioned, Paul, are, are all awful situations and awful outcomes for patients, and we recognise that as, as the medical profession. I could, of course, say that these are symptoms of a system under pressure, and what any industry in the world would do in that situation would w look to see what can be fixed within the system to improve the uh, service for patients. There is a tendency in Northern Ireland to have a blame and sanction culture. We think that the recommendation for an individual duty of candour with criminal sanction, I mean, just to say those words to a young doctor, 
So you have to have candour, and if you don't, we will bring in a criminal sanction. What kind of a job are you going to do in a high-risk environment, in a pressured system, and then you tell the young doctor that? No other country in the world has brought this in. This is a recommendation from the O'Hara report, and we're in agreement with virtually everything in the O'Hara report, but we think that particular element will be destructive. And we've had various conferences in Northern Ireland in the last few months because London, Scotland, <coughs> Wales all see this as a high-risk move within Northern Ireland. They're very concerned and they're all queuing up to come over and tell us. So, uh, Freedom to Speak Up Guardians, Henrietta Hughes, the leader for that in England, says, no, that would be the worst thing that you could do if you brought in a system, and we've all heard about the uh, Dr. Hadiza Bawagarba case, where a doctor was, came back from maternity leave without induction, where the computer stopped working, where the consultant was off-site, where she was covering three wards, where patients, two patients with Down syndrome were swapped beds, and a mistake happened, and there was a tragedy. And that system, which no doctor would want to work in, wasn't held to account. It was the doctor was held to account, sanctioned, brought through the courts, had a criminal sanction. So our, doc our young doctors are looking at this and thinking, I'm working in this system under pressure. I'm taking all these risks, and you're going to give me a criminal sanction if I raise my hand and say there's a problem here. What would, what would their natural response be? Their natural response will be not to put their hand up and say there's a problem here, because to put their hand up, they'll be Dr. Hadiza Bawa Garba. So um, if, if I said there was a, a, the biggest medium-term risk for the health service in Northern Ireland is the implementation of that. I think that uh, it won't be implemented, and the reason I think that is because every submission to the work stream, bar one, said that this was a bad idea. <coughs> uh, so the Royal College of GPs would, would echo the, I mean, the BMA's overall view on this. We recognise that GTF Candor is right. I mean, the truth telling and so on, and, and that's already implied in GMC law. You know that we are all, we already have a duty to do that. We have a couple of concerns about it. So as Tom said, you I mean with individual criminal sanctions, risks driving the profession underground and making people more defensive rather than more open. We also have a, a unique setting in general practice where sometimes GPs inadvertently know information about a patient which may not be appropriate to tell them. And if you allow me to give you an example, it may well be during if I have a patient who has gone for a scan, say for a, a CT of their skull and their head, and that, that has been ordered by a hospital consultant. If that shows a lesion that I am not qualified to give them adequate advice about, is it right for me to tell the patient that they have a lesion on their brain? Because that lesion may well be innocent. Uh, a consultant neurosurgeon may well say it's fine, it's a cyst, it will not do them any harm, or it may be a very serious malignancy. But I, as a GP, may well not have the qualifications to tell that. And to be totally truthful and honest to that patient may actually be harmful to that patient's stress and so on. So, so there are nuances as well. We certainly are, and we are duty bound by GMC guidance to tell the truth and so on and be honest and, and reflective. And GPs are reflective. Significant event analysis in our practice is part of our core. So it is as part of our core services of what we do. But, but we do have concerns, about <coughs> particularly individual uh, criminal sanctions. Thank you. And the second question, Chair. Um, it, it relates to the, the role of the BMA in terms of representing the medical and dental trainees. And I've been contacted by a number of them who um, are dismayed at the disparity in pay between England and, and here. And the, the response I got from the Department of Health really was that this was down to, it was a matter for negotiation. Um, so that's the first bit, really, just to comment on how you are actually representing that, that body, because the last thing we want to do is them to go over to England, get settled and, and not come back. Um, but the second part of it was this, uh, I think it was Monday, the Finance Minister announced that he was um, giving an extra three million to the Department of Health for um, doctors and dentists pay pressures. And I'm just asking what your understanding of what that three million pounds will go towards. Will it go towards these trainees or where do you think that that, is that going to be more about the pensions as you'd mentioned around the consultants? Just really commentary on the no, financial state. It will not go towards pensions. I think the solution for pensions is number 11 Downing Street and we'll hopefully hear from that on the 11th of March. The dental trainees is a particular case where they do not have pay parity with their equivalent grades in England. Scotland, Wales, and we are working hard to try and find the person who is responsible and will take the decision, which is not always easy. I think the uh, 
the increased funding, the three million plus that will be brought in, will hopefully be used to give uh, the pay uplift for 1920, i.e. last April. Uh, Northern Ireland tends to be a little tardy in uh, giving pay raises to their uh, health service workers, as our nursing colleagues might confirm. And uh, I appreciate it's a difficult environment uh, that we've had in the last number of years, and the department <coughs> and the trusts do their best to find the uh, pay raises for their staff. But we're, we're hoping that that will come in before the end of the relevant year. Last year's came in very late, but it's the world we live in at the moment. Don't pay party is an interesting concept, Paula, because staff, and we know this from the, from the uh, recent industrial action, staff do look to see what their equivalents are earning elsewhere, and the, people are very sensitive to relative earnings. So there. Yeah. Yeah. So in terms of the, the when you talked about the um, three Ws, the workforce, and um, you still see that there's huge gaps then in terms of the funding package going towards doctors and trainees. We try not to talk too much about money, you know. Yeah. Uh, we try to talk about pace of services and getting the job done and getting young trainees through. Um, it's sensible to make sure that your staff are paid a commensurate wage so that they're not going to go to Australia or Vancouver yeah. or New Zealand or England to get better terms and conditions. We appreciate that our terms and conditions aren't the same as the other three countries at the moment. We're working diligently in the background to try and bring that up to match. but. Uh, I don't think the public are interested in uh, well-paid doctors getting paid more, but it's obviously our job to make sure that they are well-paid <coughs> to ensure that we have recruitment and retention. Okay, thank you, thank you, Chair. Thank you. Just by way of follow-up, in, in terms of the issue of candour, and it's certainly a hugely complex issue which we will be returning to in, in more detail. And we're all sensitive to the issues that you describe of seeking to not have a culture of fear that young people coming in or people working in the service would feel supported and would feel able to yeah. um, convey lessons or put their hands up if, if things go wrong so that the system can change. But we're also all dealing with a series of families across a range of issues yeah. who have found it extremely difficult to get basic information at times, to get timely information, sometimes to get their own information. So my question would be in relation to that, and, and also bear in mind my understanding of the duty of candour would be that criminal sanction would apply to the willful cover-up of, of evidence or the willful, the willful closure. So how would you suggest that, that culture of difficulty of getting information is addressed? Sure. I'm a GP, I'm an advocate for 7,000 patients in the bog site, and I spend my life advocating for them and having difficulties with bureaucracy. I'm also a patient and a family person in my community with the same uh, motivations as you. When I read the O'Hara report, and it took me four nights to carefully go through the report with all its evidence, I was in foul humour for a week afterwards. I didn't know what was wrong with myself, and then I remembered I was so angry with everybody in that. So I, I'm with you in all your concerns. We're all part of the same community. But we're the medical profession, and we need to be careful to bring this to your attention, that that would be the wrong way to do it. Now, we have a duty of candour, as Lawrence says, within our GMC duties. And if we fail in that duty of candour, you will end up before a tribunal, and we are very good at ensuring that our profession maintains high values. The criminal sanction linking it directly to the duty of candour, we already have criminal sanction. We, we know day and daily that doctors go through the courts and are held to account in civil courts, etc. So that's fine. Th those systems are all in place, but to bring them right next to each other. Because at the moment it's a process that you go through, and you go through the GMC and you go through the courts. But to bring the two processes together, to link them inextricably as an individual duty of candour with criminal sanction, would terrify the young doctors. Our emphasis on this, and the emphasis in all the other countries, is the organisational duty of candour. To bring in an organisational duty of candour, because when I read all those documents, Chair, I was a angry with individuals, but I was really angry with organisations and their bureaucratic obfuscation. If you don't mind me using a big word, there's a rude alternative, but I'll stick with that one. Um, really made me angry. 
And I think that if we have the GMC's individual duty of candour already in a, a, a part of our duties and an organisational duty of candour, that would be a much better way to do it. And we would hopefully hold on to our young doctors. Thank you. Um, Alan. Oh, thanks, Chairman. Uh, thank you very much for the presentation. I found it very useful. Uh, and the information you've given since the start of it also very useful. Um, uh, Dr. Donner, you talked about um, the number of practices. I think it dropped from 363 to 327 over a period of time. D did that reflect as well in the number of, of practicing GPs, or was that a consolidation maybe of the same number of GPs but fewer practices? Uh, so that would be my first question. The other thing that I think I picked up in the presentation was that uh, in the survey that 40% of the uh, trainee doctors had said that they, they wouldn't recommend training in Northern Ireland. Uh, and I'm just wondering why did they, did they say why? You know, what are the reasons for that? Uh, that would be quite alarming, actually, if there are particular reasons. Um, the other thing is the retention rate of, of, of doctors coming out of medical school. I know we've talked about this new medical school at McGee, and I hope it does happen. Uh, but is there... Um, are there any terms and conditions that uh, a young medical student who qualifies uh, that they have to stay in Northern Ireland for a period of time, or can they jump on the first plane out and go to Australia or Canada? So are there any, any conditions to keep them here, and, and should there be? Okay. Uh, and the other thing is, uh, I know that the Chair will maybe not want me to invite you to talk much about this, because you'll probably talk all day about it, but I hear a lot about this pension taxation and you know when I'm complaining about the, the lack of GPs operating in doctor on call uh, I'm told it's because it's it's just not in the doctor's interest to work a certain amount of hours and all the rest of it so it, whatever it is it's impeding uh, uh, the whole health service uh, and the service that patients are getting so could you maybe, uh, in layman's language, tell me what the, just what the issue is around this pension so that I can maybe understand it a bit better? OK, so I'll leave the pensions uh, to Tom here, OK? But, but you're quite right. I mean, the number of GP practices is decreasing. So if those are voluntary mergers, that, that's OK. You know, and if two practices or two smaller practices decide voluntarily to come together to, 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 perform, a, to perform a bigger, more stronger structure that could offer better services, we're very happy with that. But unfortunately, what we're seeing is that it's happening at a time of crisis where practices are unable to recruit new partners into the, the business and so on and are feeling that they have no choice but to hand back their contract to the board uh, and then to wait to see could another practice either you know take it on as an ongoing business or is there an option of a merger so if it's done voluntarily and with goodwill on both sides and it the sum outcome is a better practice certainly we have no problem with that from our experience though is that whenever it's done chaotically it it becomes difficult and what the risk is is that if we have a new model of MDTs trying to come in if you're trying to put these new workers into a, a situation that's already chaotic it will be very difficult uh, so we would have concerns with that uh, in terms of, of trainees leaving to go across the water so that covers specialty trainees for all specialties not to, I mean it attracts with GPs as well but a lot of, of younger doctors are somewhat are, are seeing Australia and so on as, as a great place to go and work and train and I think partly we need to be a little bit pragmatic about it and a wee bit realistic about it and say that's never going to change. I mean, that's happened since 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 forever. And and young doctors in the future are going to be adventurous people. But what we need to look at is a, is innovative and imaginative ways of keeping in contact with them and ensuring that if they do go for a year or two in Australia, that they still have links back home and that they can easily come back home to work and actually bring new skills that they do ha that they do acquire out there. So. Uh, there are things that we could do to look at that, but there's no, uh, we don't support uh, any punitive things that, that, that would tie them to here at the, at the moment. But I'll leave the pensions here to Tom. The other thing was the, uh, the survey where the trainees had said they wouldn't recommend. So again, that survey relates, a lot, a, so the survey relates a, lot, a lot to their early uh, hospital days, so it does. Okay. Um, uh, but uh, 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 yeah, yes, please. Uh, uh, sorry. Remember I was saying about the, the rota gaps? Yes. And uh, if you look at the Western Trust, they're spending 25% or more. Southern Trust, pretty much the same. Northern Trust, a, a large part, about a fifth of their medical staff budget on locums. So if you've got rota gaps and you can't... I mean, with doctors who put in for a week off to get married and they're refused, and 
I shouldn't laugh. Uh, it's dreadful. It's just, you, you can't imagine that happening anywhere else. So uh, the trainees are coming up against this. Facilities where you're supposed to work uh, overnight, but there's no food or drink available, all this sort of stuff. So there's, there's lots of work we're doing in the background with the trust to try and improve those terms and conditions. The interesting thing about the uh, doctors going away is we prefer them going to Australia because they come back. When they go to England, Scotland, Wales, they stay. So weirdly, we should just encourage them all to go to Australia for a year or two. And uh, you can't take their passports off them because apparently they have access to a second passport. <laughs> so we'll not do that to them. Um, the pensions, um, keeping it simple is a challenge. So doctors are well paid. And George Osborne brought this thing in where he would bring in this tax to catch people who are entrepreneurs who are trying to avoid tax. And doctors have been caught in the crossfire, and senior civil servants and, and senior judges, etc., have been caught in the crossfire. And essentially, if you work to that level, you're fine. If you do extra work, say you take on clinical director in the hospital, or you did a waiting list initiative, or you were a GP working out of hours, and you earned an extra so much, that part of the income gets taxed at above 100 per cent. And it was a brilliant concept, doesn't it, Jerry? Tax them at a greater than 100 per cent. So you're essentially paying to work. So a simple example, a GP, a, a real example, a GP out west worked every Saturday in out of hours and uh, earned an extra £10,000. And the tax bill for that part of his earnings was £12,000. So he worked every Saturday and he paid £2,000 for the privilege which sounds like a good deal uh, for the health service and the exchequer. Um, we are working very hard in London to get this solved because if you're a consultant in your 40s and you reduce your clinical commitment by half, reduce your clinical commitment by half, that reduces your pension contributions by 30% and you get a bigger pension. I didn't make that up. So we're just reduce your clinical commitment by half and your pension will be higher. I didn't make that up. It sounds Orwellian. It is. And they're going to have to fix it, aren't they? Because if they don't. So we're relying on number 11. And I was going to say Sajid Javid, but he's been replaced already. Um, his replacement is Chancellor to bring in a fix, on hopefully on March 11th. And, and we see huge implications with out of hours. Historically, general practice out of hours was done by maybe more senior doctors who maybe had children at university, so they weren't needed at home to do, the, to do the babies, as it were. But they needed a little bit of extra income to help, you know, provide for their children who were maybe going to university and so on. So it, it is impacting enormously. Thank you. I have four more now: Orlea, Gemma, Sinead, and Jerry. So we'll just ask you to be as brief. Be brief. Yes. Thank you, Chair, and thank you, Tom and Lawrence, for the, the presentation. Um, so just quickly, Lawrence, you had mentioned the, with the MDTs and the plans to roll it out um, uh, for to cover 100,000 people per year. You had mentioned that that, w that could take 12 years to get to that point. If, just if we stay at 100,000 per year, so, so the initial first announcement from the new, new decade has yeah. been for the, an extra 100,000. Yeah. We would encourage that the rate of that to continue, because to get to the whole population of 1.8 million by 2026. OK, so we need thank to you. Be, and just some of the, the, the statistics were, were um, <coughs> worrying and actually surprised me. The, the amount of um, doctors that are, th their morale is, is low, that the third of, of junior doctors with low morale and that 70% figure of doctors feeling um, low morale or very low morale is, is um, really worrying because in any workplace I think you would struggle with retention and early retirement if you have staff that are feeling low and aren't feeling motivated um, and are struggling in, in their job you know uh, mentally so I was just wondering Tom you had mentioned around the um, uh, a comprehensive well-being element of the I don't know if that was delivering together or if that's fallen to transformation of, of some strategy but in dealing with the well-being of the staff and just a, a, a quick question is, what is in place at the minute for, for your staff? Is there any oversight? Is there any, I don't know if it would be the GP Federation, um, the department, or even the Health and Social Care Board, but is there anyone that is offering some sort of support to monitor this, to see what support they could put in place for GPs and doctors that might be struggling? Um, 
And just as you, you were speaking as well, I was thinking about, because um, I know, Lawrence, you were at the loneliness round table that we done a few weeks ago as well. And even when you're talking about the workload, if you're able to help and assist even mm. with some of the big mm. the societal issues, you're taking the pressure off GPs. But I know with the, the, the Health and Social Care Board, they have the, the local enhanced services um, and some GP practices. And I'm thinking, I'm, I'm trying to think of different ideas where you could maybe be taking the pressure off GPs. Um, you know, even dealing with the cases around mental ill health, because I know not all the practices have took up the local enhanced services. But is there any practical steps the board could help with, the GP federation could help with? Because I think the morale of your staff is really, really important. Even aside from trying to deal with, you know, the the amount of waiting lists and the pressures you're under with the the people you're dealing with. So just so, anything. So, yeah. So so there's a couple of issues there. So so yes, G, GPs are, are feeling pressure, and mm -hmm. and we would urge for for a review for occupational health services. Is that we as as staff can can have kind of access to that. Um, in terms of so MDTs are, are slightly different to, to the layers that you're referring to, which I think is, is practice based counselling. Yeah. So so the mental health workers, if they're implanted, implemented properly into a practice, would offer the patients first contact access. There is a layers that practices can voluntarily uh, access in house counselling. Yeah. Okay. But unfortunately, it's a bit patchy taken up, and that's due to various reasons. And one of the big reasons that practices will tell you we're back to the workplace again that they literally don't have room. Yes. Uh, and so that will deter a lot of people. Okay. Uh, we, we also feel that I mean. The there could be more work done to it, it takes time and it takes skills to employ staff so it does uh, there's contractual things you have to get into and a practice itself will be taking that on so if there could be support with that that could potentially help, help it more and so on but experience from practices who do have in-house counseling services are very good they will merge they will they will dovetail, dovetail nicely yeah. with the MDT model. It's not instead of a mental health worker. <coughs> the mental health worker we see with the MDT will be acting like a signposter, who then could refer somebody if there is an in-house counsellor for a block of services, you know, in that in-house counselling. And then you're right as well, the in-house counsellor could provide those services to the practice team as well. So. But it's the full circle, it's coming back to space, it's you know, workforce and, and be, all the And rest. being yep. really proactive that. about about GP premises and, and to ensure that, that all GP premises and ones even that are owned by trusts are viewed as part of the health service and an investment in the future and an investment in the whole of the of the health service. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Lawrence. Thanks, right. Gemma. All right, thank you, and thanks very much for your presentation. Um, I will try to be brief, but as you can imagine, it's an issue that's literally very close to home. So, um, I've just got a couple of issues. Um, in Fermanagh, just at the top of my head, I think we have sixteen um, very precious GP practices. And just for, on our liaison point, an over recruitment is very important and. We are really hopeful for the McGee Medical School and the cross-border um, initiative that you mentioned, but <coughs> it would just be retaining the current practices that we have, you know, so just the support for the current GPs and their well-being and their staff, you know, so that would be obviously very important. Um, so, and the other thing is, in terms of the MDTs, with social workers, physios, mental health workers, at the minute in the constituency, we're struggling with all of those. So then to try to say that they're going to be available in these MDTs, do we have social workers and physios and mental health workers to cover that at the minute or is there going to be another recruitment drive for their roles as well? So, so there's a lot of issues there, and I, I mean, I feel for, for, for the pressures down in Fermanagh and mm -hmm. so on. Uh, one of the things we work in the colleges, we have a very good a rural members forum with Miriam Dolan, who's a GP yeah. down in Fermanagh. Mm -hmm. She's excellent, uh, and we've been able to, you know, to reach out with her. And there are things that we can do with her, such as online educational resources that, that we can help support her with, with the unique challenges for for, for rural working. Um, it's it's difficult with MDTs and the recruitment. You're quite right. There there are shortages with with physiotherapists and all those, and, and we do need an adequate workforce strategy. Mm -hmm. uh, we need to be planning how many extra places do the universities need to be training yeah. to train up extra physiotherapists to, to provide these workers. Um, it's very important that that we get uh, good coverage. And unfortunately, there is with this transformation, it's not easy, and it's not easy for trusts for staff to go from trust to general practice. There is an element of of pain with this, and that that that's just part of transformation is not easy for anybody mm -hmm. uh, but we we are fully supportive of this model Gemma, ju just to give you an insight chair about the mcgee medical school and the gardner report this time last year was very very clear about the importance of recruiting from underserved areas mm -hmm. what that means is that for mana a level students should be given a priority i'm dictating now already and they haven't even set up this medical school but they should be given a priority 
to places in McGee. They should go to practices and the South West Hospital for training in that area so that they can meet their uh, significant other and settle down and work for 35 mm. years in a, in a wonderful place. Yeah. So <clears throat> it's not just about training them in McGee and hoping that they go uh, yeah. to Fermanagh. Yeah. It, it's actually more fundamental than that. Recruit them from underserved areas, yeah. train them in that area, and then they will naturally stay there. Yeah because that's where their roots are. Yeah, that's brilliant. And just for something, <coughs> could we get a copy of the paper on the cross-border work? Yes, absolutely. Please, please. Thank you, uh, Sinead, and then we're finishing up with Jerry. Thank you, and thank you for your presentation. I'm still absorbing that perverse um, incentive about uh, <coughs> pensions. But um, it's, it's following on from Gemma's point. It's the MDT model. I do see that. Um, I take your point down to where you said it's a... It's an unsettled model at this time, so a GP or a trainee GP may be reluctant to embrace that because it may be a bit chaotic while it beds down. But I'm just trying to join the dots here. When I look at the MDT model, and you talked about it would be helpful to have a timetable of where it may roll out and the locations might be worth identifying early on. And given that there are geographical blocks across Northern Ireland where it's more difficult to recruit to. Is there merit in saying MDT models should be based in these areas? These areas should then, what should naturally follow that, and I take in the whole coding and data um, model that we're trying to improve generally overall. So these MDT models geographically and strategically placed with access to good broadband with access to purpose-built uh, properties or buildings that will host and hold all the services that are required. And then linking in also, and I want to delve in further to it, you're talking about an additional, is it an additional one year for training you're talking about to bring it to four years? I think it's saying that it, for a GP. Oh, for, for general practice training? Yes. yes, yes an additional. So is there merit in that being on site? in these geographical locations where they have a good team and maybe then bedding into a community where they, after their training, might think I'm comfortable here. Um, this is a, a, a geographical area I could serve. So there's a lot there, but, but then I have to ask the question, if you added to the, the length of time you would take um, to become quali fully qualified, is there a danger that people might, I don't know how that compares with elsewhere, might they just go elsewhere to England, say, if it was a, a shorter course before they would? I, th I think the decision in the four years will be a UK-wide decision. Okay. Um, so we'll w uh, wait for the Royal College in, in London to uh, sort that out. Um, the MDT, just, just to emphasise how wonderful the MDTs are, because we all, we're all, we all feel it here, but I live it. So... Bogside practice and recruitment problem. Nobody wants to come and work. And I didn't <coughs> put the word bogside in the advertisement, but there you go. And we had half the number of doctors and 7,000 of the most deprived patients. And to be quite frank, the practice would have closed, except we were one of the pilot areas that got the multidisciplinary team. So we got the pharmacist in, which took two hours of my work straight over there per day. Mm -hmm. Amazing. We got the musculoskeletal specialist in, the social worker in, the mental health worker in. We changed our system so that instead of me trying to see 35 or 40 people a day, on Monday I spoke to 45 people on the phone. Sorted out half of them, because most of them were saying, you know, I don't need to see, but could you? Sorted out half of them, sent some of them to the multidisciplinary team, and then I ended up seeing another maybe 20 of them and went off and signed uh, lots of prescriptions as well. So we have survived by completely changing it around. Everybody's seen on the same day. Everybody's triaged within one hour. And the patients love it. They think this is an even better service than it was before. And yet it's underpinned by far fewer doctors and the multidisciplinary team. And let's give uh, good credit to the Department of Health who worked with the GPs on this uh, and brought this in. This is transformation of the health service and in real places. To give you an insight, we have the worst waiting list for secondary care. TPs provide the best access, the highest number of consultations per patient in the UK with the highest quality. Our GP service is better, despite all the problems, better than anywhere else in the UK. Wow, nobody says that, do they? Mm -hmm. 
And again, through the point I made earlier about it being, it wasn't it wasn't disorganised. It's just if if there's an MDT team and it's up and running mm. to a new GP, that'll be a more attractive place to work. Mm -hmm. So if it's running well mm. in Tom's place, True. they're more likely to come there than they are to Fermanagh. So so there's risks yeah. of inequity both if yeah. Tom's patients are getting a great service, and Fermanagh isn't as well. There's two levels of inequity, both from mm. patient and then recruitment drive. So so there are risks with both of those areas. Mm. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Chair. Thanks for your presentation. Um, just a couple of quick points from me. I, I think um, picking up from Paula's key, uh, comment and the Chair's comment. I mean, I think obviously we all understand and appreciate the importance of our GPs and, the, and their work uh, and the professional uh, duties that they carry out. But I think there has been cases where there's been whistleblowing, there's been concerns raised, and they haven't been followed up. Um, in, in regards to particular cases in terms of that are out in the news. And I think um, when our alarm bells are raised and people are raising concerns and they're not followed up upon, and that's suggesting yourselves or anybody here, but I mean beyond, um, I think it, there's a concern and obviously it fails patients, but also it fails uh, GPs because people will could look upon them as being maybe um, suspicious or um, distrust could be could, could develop from that. So I think there's there's a concern that obviously we we'll have to protect our GPs, but we we'll have to protect our patients. I think as well. So uh, and, and in cases that that hasn't happened uh, in the recent past. Uh, but two quick comments, uh, sorry, questions for me. Um, I've been involved a lot uh, when Stormont was down around uh, the uh, PIP appeal cases around <laughs> where we were formerly on DLA and we're moving over to PIP. Uh, and my experience was there was a lot of difficulty for people to get their medical notes. Uh, it took a lot of time. Um, my understanding is because GP practices are under a lot of pressure and they can't. It takes a lot of time to print out hundreds of pages and to arrange them and all that. Um, so a comment from yourselves, if you have any figures in terms of the, the length of time that it's taken people uh, and any um, ideas for assistance that can be done to help people to um, get their medical notes if they're trying to appeal a benefit a decision. Uh, and then just on the MDT stuff. Um, uh, my understanding is there's there's difficulties in rolling them out, not just in, in rural areas, but in some urban areas as well. So maybe if you can touch upon your experience, um, uh, Dr. Black from the Bog, say, you know, how could that be replicated across um, across the north? So, thank you. Um, so, uh, let Tom actually answer just the first. But uh, well, like, the, the MVT is, is about getting. Uh, staff in so you've got to find the physiotherapists that are trained up to the right level you've got to get the health visitors trained so yeah it, and that's why there wasn't enough funding to roll it out to all 17 federations in one go but if you tried to it wouldn't have worked anyway jerry because there wouldn't have been enough physios and pharmacists etc but we've done it with pharmacists over five years you just work hard you make the job attractive and and it'll work like that um the, the PIP thing is interesting, and I have a solution for you, uh, which will rule out throughout Northern Ireland now that I mention it. I, GPs go home when the work's finished. Yeah. You know, you don't go home at that time. There's no European Working Time Directive. We're, we're self-employed. So on a Friday, I would stay and do the GDPR reading of the, you know, so somebody wants their notes, and they've had 5,000 consultations, and you think I just exaggerated. I didn't. And if 263 hospital letters, which is quite low, and I've got to read all of that before I can pass the records out. And I have three or four every week to read. And you're, that's war and peace times mm -hmm. three or four every Friday evening. And I would go home uh, to my darling wife on Friday evening at a certain hour, and she would go, your dinner's ruined. <laughs> and the joke, of course, is how will I, how will I notice? <laughs> and you're reading all these notes, and you're trying to keep up, and that's a terrible strain. So what we did in our practice, multidisciplinary team, uh, was uh, we brought in a GDPR person. So we brought in a retired teacher who has been trained to read all these and bring us issues, and she's now part of our multidisciplinary team, and she does all the GDPR stuff. So it's it's trying to work and be clever, but it's a real workload issue. Could I ask on that? It would be more or less a full-time job. You know, it would be... How many hours a week? I would imagine. Hope she's not listening. It's part time. <laughs> <laughs> so it would vary. It would vary between practice, but again, the MDT, the social worker element of that practice, can help support you know us with with, with PEP applications and so on. It would be very important. It's a huge problem, Jerry, yeah. and it's just the law, and you've got to stick to it. And there's a time. You have to be back within 40 working days. My yeah. manager yeah. does, yeah, yeah, That's yeah. It. and we adhere to it as best we can. Well, we adhere <laughs> to it. End of story.
Okay, thank you very much to both of you for coming along doing that presentation and for your interaction and, and answer to the questions. And thank you and good luck. Thanks, Scott. Thank you. Thanks, folks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So, members, I suggest we take a short comfort break there. Can I ask members to return by 5 to 12 there so we can get back on track? Thank you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber programme signed.
This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed. Okay, members, thank you and welcome back.
Can I advise members that departmental officials are here today to brief the Committee on the transformation of health and social care. I refer members to the Department's briefing paper at pages 15 to 24 of the pack and to the Clerk's memo at pages 45 to 51 of the table papers. So I would like now to welcome to the Committee Mrs. Ms. Sharon Gallagher, Deputy Secretary for Transformation and Planning, Department of Health, Ms. Kira Dolan, Director of Transformation, Department of Health, and Mr. Giroud Casey, Transformation Programme Manager, Department of Health. So thank you very much, and if you would like to go ahead and brief the committee, please. Thank you, Chair. I was talking Dalish there, and she described me as a frequent flyer. I hope not. I hope <laughs> this is my last flight. So, so good morning, members, and thank you for having us here today. I provided a short paper on transformation of the health service in advance of today's meeting, which I hope has given members a flavour of this complex issue. And if you're content, I'd like to share more detail with the committee on this important matter. So I, I briefed you a few weeks ago on the issue of tackling unacceptable waiting lists. We discussed the work required to ensure that alongside managing the backlog, it was essential to put in place new ways of working, which will allow us to meet future demand and prevent those backlogs reoccurring. Those new ways of working will be brought about through the transformation agenda. You will all be aware of the numerous challenges facing health and social care services in Northern Ireland, not least of our ageing population, which is seeing people live longer but with more long-time health conditions. This presents a huge and growing challenge in terms of the system's capacity to meet demand, an issue which I am sure you have already been discussing with the groups you have been meeting in recent weeks. Health inequalities also continues to persist in Northern Ireland, between the most and least deprived areas, where there is growing evidence that children who experience adversity in childhood are more likely to experience health issues in later life. And then there is a the significant challenge presented by our current service delivery model, which is no longer fit for purpose, with recruitment issues making attracting and retaining staff to prop up this outdated system even more challenging. It was these and other challenges within the system which led to the publication of the Bingoa report, Systems Not Structures, in October 2016. This report spoke of the need for a long-term, sustainable transformation of health and social care system, and in response, the Health Minister at the time published Health and Wellbeing 2026, Delivering Together, which laid down a roadmap for transformation over a 10-year period. Delivering Together seeks to radically reform the way health and social care services are designed and delivered in Northern Ireland, with a focus on person-centred care rather than on buildings and on structures. It is aligned with the aspirations set out within the Northern Ireland Executive's Draft Programme for Government and aims to improve the health of our people, improve the quality and experience of care, ensure the sustainability of our services and to support and empower staff but also recognises the challenges that need to be overcome if all of this is to be achieved. Delivering Together recognises that transformation is a journey rather than a destination. It is an iterative process which will be co-produced to ensure that the needs of those who rely on and work within health and social care services inform, shape and are at the heart of this important change. Delivering Together is clear how we plan, design, support and implement service transformation is as important as the changes we wish to make. It therefore makes commitments to partnership working, to investing in our workforce, to improving quality, to driving collective leadership and making best use of technology and data. It also recognises that transformation cannot ha happen in isolation and that stabilisation as well as reconfiguration will complement, enable and support transformation to happen and that this, importantly, will take time and money. I would like to take a few minutes to highlight some of the developments which have been made possible in the last few years through the Transformation Agenda, and I am conscious that I covered some of those the last time. Programmes like Elevate, led by the Community Development Health Network, are supporting communities to work collaboratively, making best use of local resources in order to reduce health inequalities and ensure the next generation's health and social care outcomes are better. We have invested in training social workers in new ways of working, which is proving successful in empowering families to build on their own strengths and to support their own well-being, with the right help and support available to them. And work is also progressing in the development of family support hubs, working with hard-to-reach families. 
in the operation of an HIV prevention clinic and the delivery of a new homelessness hub, which are all successfully engaging with those within our communities who may otherwise not access the services they need or which are available to them. We have introduced new multidisciplinary teams in primary care to increase services available in GP settings, and I heard you just got a, a briefing on that from colleagues. This new model of care has introduced first contact physiotherapy, social work, mental health practitioners, and it enhanced levels of district health nursing and health visiting into GP practices. With these disciplines all working together for the first time to ensure the right services are available at the right time to those who need them. We have also undertaken a programme of service reviews, which have included public consultations on stroke services and breast assessment services. These are now being analysed and will be considered by our Minister. Prototype day case selective care centres for cataracts and varicose veins were introduced in December 2018 and are currently being piloted. And we have invested about 28 million in building our workforce and empowering them to undertake the roles that they are skilled to do. In terms of addressing the waiting list, we, our investment over the last two years has allowed an additional 120,000 people to be seen or treated in 1819 and 70,500 in 1920 proposed for the end of the year. And importantly, we are organising ourselves to deliver in a more efficient and effective way, with work progressing on the legislative provision to give effect to the closure of the Health and Social Care Board and work also ongoing to scope a future planning model for health and social care services. As I said earlier, co-production is at the heart of how we develop and implement new ways of working, and we have invested in building capacity and capability to embed new ways of working. And we are moving forward with our digital health agenda in Compass, which will transform the way HSC services are accessed and are delivered. Good progress has been made, but the task ahead is significant and will require additional investment. In 2016, Delivering Together was agreed by the Northern Ireland Executive with cross-party support and recognition that the transformation of health and social care in Northern Ireland would require a period of double running. That is additional recurrent investment over and above what it takes to run existing services. Given the broader financial position, double running has not been possible. However, £200 million was made available through the Confidence and Supply Agreement over the two-year period 2018-19 and 19-20. Whilst this money was non-recurrent, it did provide an important injection of funding to begin the transformation process through the onboarding of over 170 projects across the entire span of health and social care. Moving forward, the financial position remains challenging. The Department's budget, as it currently stands, is insufficient to meet current demand, rising pressures, or to systematically tackle the growing waiting list backlog, with the added pressures of affecting your savings. And whilst the confidence in supply money funding has been a positive enabler, the result of the investment has impacted on the financial position for 2021 with an estimated £150 million needed next year to sustain and grow those initiatives which began over the first two years. The pace and scale of transformation will undoubtedly be influenced by the finance available, but as in previous years, we will work hard to ensure any investment is maximised to improve health and social care services. The renewed commitment to health and social care transformation through the New Decade New Approach has reaffirmed delivering together as the roadmap for change. Importantly, transformation is now moving into a new phase, from planning and foundation laying to implementation and building a new, modern and sustainable system. But these changes will present challenges to all of us, operational, strategic, strategic and emotional. Transformation is complex, it is multifaceted, and it will take time and resource. It will impact on all of us, but to stay still is simply not an option. Thank you, Chair. Thank you um, for the presentation, Sharon. And I, I suppose we, we would all acknowledge that there is a huge amount being done. I think we had a very good discussion this morning with the RCGP and the BMA around the multidisciplinary teams. Um, in terms of the health inequalities that you mentioned and which are having a serious impact on, on parts of our community, 
How are you linking the improvement in health inequalities to transformation? How are you measuring that? So, health inequalities um, is a key part of the overall transformation agenda. We recognise that really we have to stem the flow into primary care services and secondary care services by supporting people to look after their own health. That's why we have invested in pilots in a number of areas, healthy, healthy places pilots, in places like Lisnesky and Ballycastle and Belfast, in order to enable local communities to uh, understand better how they can look after themselves, both mentally and physically, for the future. Um, there's a, quite a broad range of initiatives in terms of the Community develop, Development Health Network, which I talked about earlier, and that's working with um, with uh, people at local level, with, with just within individual communities, to help help them maximise the resources that they have available to them, and help them enable people at a local level to support themselves and help themselves. Um, PHA is key in this work, uh, Chair. Um, and it's coordinating the effort and actually looking at the resource that we have available and the initiatives that are ongoing at the minute in order that, that we can really focus on what works uh, to support people at community level. Well, thank you, thank you for that. And I do hear what you're saying about in terms of putting in the resources. What I'm asking is how are you going to evidence that health inequalities are actually being addressed in the way that we want them to be addressed? I beg your pardon. What would success look? Yes, so thank what you. are the metrics? So I guess on two levels, first of all, each of the interventions that we bring forward will have metrics or outcomes that are measurable. We've come to the end of or coming to the end of our two year programme. So there's a broad programme of evalu evaluation ongoing at the minute to decide which initiatives need to be brought forward for the future. But what I would say is most of these are short term, only been on the ground probably for up to a year, a year and a half max. Really, um, there's a couple of things that I would say there. First, health and social care outcomes are not primarily the determinant of what we do within Delivering Together. They're part of the broader programme or draft programme for government outcomes, so they will require working right across government. Um, secondly, in terms of the measurement of that, that needs to be done over the long term and in line with the draft programme for government outcomes. So you will know that there are a range of indicators underpinning the programme for government outcomes, which the Delivering Together programme and the, initiative, uh, the initiatives feed into. So it will be an ongoing uh, longitudinal evaluation in terms of what works well um, on health inequalities and on a range of other areas. But I take it that it would be in real time feeding into what, what has worked well and therefore what we put Absolutely. additional resources. And also, just, just coming back to that, I, I understand that there is objective need centrally within the programme for government, and that's important, and that health plays its role. But what are the actual, what are the actual things that you measure to see if health inequalities are being addressed? So I haven't got that information uh, with me at the minute. As I say, at, a, at an intervention level, we will evaluate every project to ensure that it delivers what we intended it to deliver. Is that, is that in terms of delivering so many hours of resource or whatever, or is it in terms of outcome? Outcome. And how outcome. do you measure outcome? I'm really trying to figure how you actually measure a good outcome. So um, I guess every intervention is different. So in terms of the Community Development Health Network, for example, we have a range of outcomes that we will look to to evaluate at the end of that programme to see whether it met what it was intended to do. The work that I referred to in terms of the healthy places in, in areas such as Listness Quay and, and Ballycastle will have a different set of outcomes. It will be a mixture of outcomes and outputs depending on the nature of the work that's being brought forward, uh, because some of the work will be research work or will be early uh, kind of development work, um, but each will be assessed based on the business case that's set out, here's what we intend to achieve, in order to make a decision on rolling them forward. I'm not answering your question. I no, I, I'm, I'm, still, I'm, still, I'm still trying to understand, and, and if, if, if necessary, if you need to come back to us, but what, what I want to know is how we are measuring that that is having an actual impact on health inequalities. So, uh, and I suppose this is where I'm, I'm trying to look at the short term and the long term. So long term, that's tied into our programme for government and our indicators underpinning programme for government. I think what I'm not able to give you today, Chair, is just 
specifically what those indicators are, and I'm more than happy to provide those, but anything that we do feeds into that long-term uh, aspiration under programme for government and the uh, process there for measuring outcomes. Yeah. Well, I, I appreciate it if you would if you would come back to us, because I think in terms of the committee, it's essential it's essential what gets measured gets done. So if we're not taking those measurements, we're not understanding what's working, what's delivering in terms of health inequalities, rather than just things that feel right or whatever, we need to actually have the evidence so we can tailor, tailor the budgets in such a way into the areas that we can demonstrate are working and that we know are lifting people out of those health inequalities over a period of time. We're not expecting a short-term fix, but if we're going to guide the journey, we need to know what's, what's happening in real, in real time. And can I just say, um, Chair, that I agree with that absolutely, and I guess that's one of her challenges in terms of bringing forward new initiatives, because none of these act in isolation, and they, you know, um, they work uh, together with a number of dif different initiatives. I mean, in terms of people's outcomes and health inequalities, housing, employment, you know, many things, the economy, many things feed into that, and it can be difficult to measure a single intervention and how that impacts on the overall health outcomes for the population. So it, it is multi-layered and it is multi-complex. And I think what I'm trying to describe is for each area that we have funded, each intervention that we have funded, we will have a very clear evaluation on that. But it's a much more complex position when you put everything together to understand, well, what's the big levers? So we think we have a fair understanding of, of uh, where we should invest money, but the point that you make is, is absolutely correct. We only have a limited amount of money, and there is much that we can do, and we need to, need to make sure that we invest it in the right things. Because it's essential for all of those services in the longer term that we do deal with inequalities, and that all of the other, all of the others. But our, our principal focus is on how health is contributing to that. I recognise there's a cross-departmental job of work to be done in our society and, and all of that. I the other question, the, the, the final question for me, the briefing makes reference to 735,000 people having access to MDTs once, once the rollout is complete. Um, and we've heard some figures earlier of concern around that same, around, around how long the rollout would take to complete across all of. But is there a target date by which all patients will have access to an MDT? So obviously depending on additional money and resource, but over a five-year period, uh, we would hope to roll out to all areas of Northern Ireland. That would be a plan, but that plan is based on many, many assumptions, including available workforce and additional funding. Okay, and in, in the key deliverable to you refer to, for example, um, ensuring every GT, GP practice has a named district nurse, health visitor and social worker to work with. The target date was March 2017, and it's described as being complete, but it then says multidisciplinary, multidisciplinary teams are being rolled out in, these, in three areas. So how is it complete if it's being rolled out? I think it's, uh, it was the wording of the, um, the action in terms of we will, we will begin that process. It really does depend on having workforce and money to roll out. It, it, is, it is challenging to roll out new models on top of uh, providing the resource that we have. That really is double running. So at one level, you're, you're continuing with the service you have and you're adding something on top of that. We have maximised in terms of what we can roll out on MDTs at this point in time. We have had challenges with recruitment in different areas and the model for MDTs is slightly different depending on which area you are. Some of that is, is tailored towards the needs of the population within that area, but some of it also is in relation to challenges uh, with recruitment in areas like mental health workers. So, as I say, the plan on paper would look at five-year rollout, but is based on many assumptions. But it's not complete that, that every GP practice has a named district, district nurse and social worker, is that...? It wouldn't be, not every GP practice. OK, well, I think we'd, we'd, want, to, we'd, want, to, we'd want to see how, what the timelines are in terms of making sure <coughs> that that is complete, given that that's a key deliverable. I think that's... OK, I'll, uh, can you come back to us with, with more information yep, on, in relation to a better breakdown on how that is, because that's, that's clearly not... Uh, not complete, so we need to know more information on that. I then have a number of indications from members. Um, Paula, please. Thank you. Oh, thank you. Good to see you again. Um, you, you 
quite rightly said that all the parties were in favour of the transformation and, and signed up to the Bengoa principles. So I really want to focus in on the um, consultation that took place during the um, three-year hi hiatus into breast assessment centres. Um, first of all, I'm, I'm just wondering around the role of the expert panel that was commissioned by the department. We know that, that the panel didn't actually visit all the sites, including Belfast City Hospital, which is obviously where the regional cancer centre is. Uh, we know that there wasn't a consensus reached from that expert panel into which of the Belfast urban settings would go, and I'm wondering who took the decision then to move then that the consultation paper moved the service to the Ulster from the city. And so to drill it down, and, and forgive me members, obviously this is my constituency, but we do know um, at least 30% of the people who go for assessment in the city hospital are from other trust areas. But why on earth would you move the, that one part of screening, it's just, this, it, it's just one part of screening. Why would you move that from the Regional Cancer Centre, from the Cancer Research and Cell Biology Centre, from the PHA funded um, NI Biobank, from where there are surgeons who are just breast surgeons and don't have any other caseload? Why on earth would you have a bit of political ground sharing to take it from there and move it from there whenever there isn't any discernible change in what the service will look like. Who took those decisions? So I guess what I would say is that um, we had over 4,600 people responded to the consultation on breast assessment um, and we had a number of uh, consultation events around the province and, and I was at a couple of them. I think it's fair to say that we heard loud and clear what people had to say, um, and that will be reflected in our consultation response to a, a minister. Um, so the level of detail underpinning that in terms of who made decisions, I, I'm not cited on at this point in time, those multiple decisions in terms of what, what you've described, Paula. But um, the main point that I would like to convey today is we have heard through that consultation process what people are saying on these matters, and that is reflected in, in uh, the report to the Minister. Okay. I'll just leave it there, but I do think we'd like an update as soon as possible because there's obviously concern, because we don't want the transformation process to be discredited because we think that the decision making and the, the lead up to the decision making has been flawed. Because I do want to see reconfiguration. I do want to see regional specialisms and, and all of that. And obviously as an urban MLA, I, I would want that. But I just think that in this case, there, there, there are serious issues. And I, I welcome that you are going to reflect on what the response was. So thank you. Thank you, Jerry. Thanks, sure. Thanks for your presentation. Uh, I welcome the fact that the uh, report that you um, submitted uh, recognise that their, the NHS is under resourced. I think that's true, and obviously everybody I assume would support that uh, when the current budget isn't uh, sufficient to meet demand and a uh, serious in injection of cash is, is required. But I'm also concerned because with that um, accepted, um, and in, in your report, there's also a logic that follows from that, that we have to you know, strip back our services in the NHS. So there's an admission that we're underfunded, but also a logic that says we have to cut back in our health service, and that's very, very worrying, which you know, obviously presents all sorts of problems with people's health problems, uh, weakens the NHS generally. So something that I'm um, concerned about, and, uh, very much so. And I think, Sean, in your comments, you said uh, we need to ensure those who rely on the health service inform and shape its transformation. I think that's, that's true. And following on from, from Paul's point, I think it has to be done in regards to everything, but especially the breast um, transformation, the breast assessment clinics. And I'm concerned because there's been a pattern uh, of behaviour in the last few years where essentially um, decisions have been made by the department and presented to the public as being done and dusted, uh, and you have to essentially like it uh, uh, or lump it, uh, and that, that's the problem fundamentally. It doesn't engage people, doesn't include people, and it presents uh, things as being a fait accompli. Um, so in regards to the breast assessment service uh, uh, clinics, uh, I think you said there's 4,000 uh, odd uh, in terms of responses, but I'm aware there's, there was a petition of several thousand, maybe 10 or 20,000, somewhere in that um, uh, figure. Um, so I, I would ask, I mean, in terms of the response, has a decision been made? Because I think it is 
Um, it beggars belief that, especially in West Belfast, you have a, a situation where uh, the ha- uh, it has a 76% uh, detection rate of stage 1 and stage 2 um, uh, cancer, which is, I think, 2% higher than the national average. So that's working for people in West Belfast and for South and other areas. So why would, you, why would there be a proposal to close, reduce and downplay that um, assessment centre in the City Hospital and move it to Dundonald or elsewhere where people you can't guarantee that people will go to. So it's very, very concerning uh, for me and for others um, as well. And you know, if it isn't broke and it's working, why would you try and change it? Um, so a question on that. Um, but it's, it's very, very important in terms of where decisions are being made, people not being included and people actually being excluded. Uh, and just another question. Um, there, I think in the report there's 1,600 staff, extra staff for transformation. Just um, can I get a breakdown of, of where they're where they're at? So um, three points. I think Jerry, bear with me. Um, yep. The first point, just in terms of the cutbacks, um, transformation is absolutely not about cutting back on staff or cutting back on services. What it the Bengoa report, as you know, does say clearly that the way our buildings are structured doesn't lend itself to a modern service, to a service for this century. So what we're trying to do is look at the model of services and develop new ways of working, but also uh, new roles for people working in health and social care. So this is absolutely not about making having less people in health and social care, but actually developing the workforce, empowering the workforce and changing the workforce to meet the needs of people moving forward rather than 20 and 30 years ago. So, But that being the case, what transformation is about is sustainability, because you could put all of the block grant into health over the next couple of years and it wouldn't be enough. It's just it, we need to change something. So it's about sustainability rather than cost efficiency. In terms of the policy making and the process of consultation, um, I'm sorry that, that there's an impression that the department makes decisions that uh, you know that doesn't take account of, of people's views, um, and that's something that we will need to try harder to mitigate. Um, certainly, I was at a meeting um, a couple of years ago on the uh, criteria for reconfiguration of services. And we heard that loud and clear from the constituents in, in the Newry area to say, you come and you ask us questions, but we never hear anything, and then you make your own. So we hear that loud and clear. Um, in terms of the breast, just as I, I said to Paula, um, we heard what people said, uh, and that will be reflected in the position report for a minister to make a decision. So we're back into the appropriate policy making, and the minister will make a decision on the way forward. And just quickly, Chair, um, what I know we don't have the report, I don't think, in front of you, but briefly, what's what's in that report? What is the re- recommendation to the minister? So. That's for the minister, obviously, first to consider. It's in draft at the minute. It hasn't been presented to the minister, so it would be wrong for me to indicate. Is there a time frame for that to be presented to the minister? It's still being finalised, but it's nearing completion. Okay. And on the last point, yeah, yeah, Yeah. sorry, on the last point, um, you give me a list every time I come here. (laughs) On the last, that's a short list. (laughs) I give you more questions, but I know the chair is going to. I think was, there's, uh, if you're referring to the amount of people funded through transformation over mm-hmm. the two years, I think it's just over 1,100. 1,600 in the report. It's 1,600, yeah. beg your pardon. We can give you a breakdown of those. Okay, thanks. Uh, do you come back to the committee with that breakdown, please? <laughs> Arlia. Yes, thank you, Chair. Um, thank you, Sharon. Uh, yeah, I just had a question around the, <coughs> the criteria for transformation, if I'm correct, um, has yet to be published after consultation, I think at the minute the, the current criteria is being used um, is the, the change or withdrawal of services policy, um, HSCB 2014. So my question is if the, the criteria for transformation um, has yet to be decided, would this risk um, any of the work that's been done so far on transformation? So would any of the projects that are currently going through the transformation process, if the criteria changes, would they all have to be reviewed also? Um, and then just around the, you had mentioned the £150 million pound, um, for the rollout of existing projects and services. I was just wondering if this £150 million, um, would be over and above the £100 million 
that's been um, spent to start the projects. And I suppose just to say on a positive note, um, I mean, it was going back maybe two, three years ago whenever our Sinn Féin team met with yourself and Goroid at the beginning of this process. Um, and I have to say, personally, I'm delighted to see that some of the schemes that have been rolled out, particularly around the mental health with the, the street triage and the custody pilot suites, um, we're getting really, really good feedback from service users and from the police and, and the ambulance service. So it's just to say that it is good to see when these projects are working and just hopefully long they may continue. Thank you. Thank you. I think we would equally share that. I mean, we're delighted with some of the projects that have been rolled out and we would very much want to keep those on the ground. In terms of the reconfiguration criteria, and I think I mentioned it when I was uh, speaking about going to the Newry consultation, they actually have been signed off. Uh, so they are published on our website and I can provide a copy for the committee. Um, they didn't change very much from those that were put forward and take into account things like outcomes, alternative provision uh, and, and all of the things that um, Professor Bengoa and the expert uh, panel set out would be um, issues. So um, that's agreed okay. and th that uh, is on our website. In terms of the 150 million, the 150 million is the amount that it will take to sustain what we have on the ground at the minute and grow for the next year. So um, it's to keep what we have going mm -hmm. and to, to grow it a little bit. Okay. So it's 150 million. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Gemma? Thanks, Chair. Um, thank you very much for that. Um, I've just got a couple of questions. Um, the first one is, in paragraph 15, it says 18 initial actions have been completed and in the table all status are green and complete. Does that mean that the department has no further actions in regards to transformation or what does that mean with the green um, status? The other thing is, can I have an update on the, just like the breast assessment consultation, the reshaping stroke services consultation? Sure. And where's that at? Um, and around the MPTs as well. Um, you sound really cautious about saying that could be done within five years. <coughs> Dr Black was in here and said that within 10 years we could have a serious crisis in Fermanagh where you're bussing people up to a GP. So I just want you to see the urgency. And I'm not saying that MBTs are going to solve every problem that we have, but you know they're quite urgent and you know I'd welcome some urgency on that. And the other thing is um, in paragraph 37, it refers to decisions having to be made. Um, can you provide examples of what sort of decisions these could be? Thank you. Okay, so um, in terms of the 18 actions and whether the department um, feels that they've finished their transformation, mm -hmm. I wish that was the case. So, that, I, so I'm just wondering. <laughs> yeah, that was the initial 18 actions that Minister O'Neill. Minister O'Neill didn't want to publish a strategy without mm -hmm. an action plan. Yeah. So that was our initial action plan, and that action plan was really important because soon after that, obviously, the, exe the executive um, wasn't in place, mm -hmm. and we were able to continue that work on the back of both the strategy and the action plan. So those actions may be completed or come into a conclusion, but uh, behind that we have a range of other work. So each year we enter into another phase of transformation based on the amount of money that we have available and the priorities that we see at that time. And those priorities in the absence of um, an administration have been discussed and agreed by the Transformation Implementation Group, mm -hmm. which is chaired by the Chief Executive and has all of the heads of the um, Health and Social Care uh, Trusts and the top management group in the department. So it's, it's very much early days. Um, and what I would say actually is really what we've done is we've just dipped our toe in transformation, even though some of the work has, has had a really good outcome. We've only just dipped our toe in it. There is much more ahead. And I'll, I'll come to your last question, uh, if I can now, yeah. Gemma, which is about decisions to be taken. Yeah. The big decisions that we're talking about are things like breast assessment services and where they are and how they're going to be delivered, stroke assessment, where it is. That's the big, big decisions that are coming ahead of us. We've spent the last two years working busily, I hope, in developing options, in engaging, in co-producing, in, in consultations, in order to form views and opinions and bring to a minister some considerations. But um, back to the fact that um, you know delivering together was a, a cross-party, a a cross-party agreed. 
some of these decisions will need executive support. They are significant in terms of local communities and terms of, I think I mentioned it in my opening remarks, they will impact on all of us. Um, in terms of stroke, so if we had 4,600 odd um, responses on breast, we had 19,000 on stroke. So that, I think, says a lot about you know, people's engagement with the process and how they feel about transformation and services and, and services local to them. And again, similar to the breast assessment, we're pulling together. It has taken some time, obviously, both with breast assessment and stroke, mm -hmm. to consider all of those responses and put together a, a report that um, can, can advise the Minister. Um, and in terms of the crisis in GPs and the 10-year and, and uh, Dr Black's um, view about the system in crisis, I couldn't agree more with Dr Black. But what I'm talking about is not a lack of aspiration. It's a reality in terms of both the staff that we have available and the funding that we have available over the next period to implement multidisciplinary team working. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Um, Pam, and then I have Sinead. Thank you. Thank you for your uh, presentation today. Uh, we absolutely uh, recognise the, the severe challenges ahead, and it's, it's very welcome that, uh, that the 18 priority actions within that delivering together document um, have got the, the green light. And I just want to you know, commend the work that has been done to date in very challenging circumstances. Um, and obviously, con consultation is incredibly um, important, and I think we're all very aware that there will be will be very unpopular decisions to be made in the future and I think um, across this assembly we have to support the Minister and the Department in making those decisions that will allow transformation to happen so I think that's very important to, to state that. I, I just want to ask you in terms of um, technology and um, what's available now and what's, uh, um, um, what is the Department looking at going into the future in terms of um, artificial intelligence and we know we have the, the young compass um, coming on board as well. I'm just wondering, is, is, there, is there more to be done or is, are you actively looking at you know, really new uh, innovative ways of actually changing how, how we operate and, or how we operate systems or how we diagnose and, and what help is there there to actually um, push ahead uh, with transformation? So I think it's a really important point, Pam, in terms of um, it's not an IT system. Encompass isn't an IT system as such. It actually will drive transformation because the point that we're making about systems, not structures, isn't just about our buildings. It's also about the use of artificial intelligence, the use of all of the things that banks and other people use. In many ways, they're, they're way ahead of health and social mm. care. And we need to actually get up front, get upstream in some of that, um, so that we can allow people to check for, you know, their blood pressure from their own lap, from their own, um, you know, phone or their own laptop or whatever. So <coughs> Encompass as a program is still, uh, again, at its infancy, um, but. Over the period that we're talking about, it will actually lead transformation in terms of, and I keep saying about allowing people to access services in a different way and us to deliver services in a different way. You know, some of the presentations that we've got on this, um, and I'm very happy if the committee would like to, to have a presentation, particularly on Encompass and, and what it can deliver, but it is, it's incredible what we don't have and what is available. So. All I would say on that, Pam, is you're absolutely right, and that is where we want to be with the Encompass programme, that we maximise, that this is not just an IT system that underpins what we do every day, but that it actually leads the, head, it leads the way in terms of the way we transform our services. Um, and as I say, I'm more than happy to, to follow up with, with colleagues in the department if that would be helpful on the presentation. I think through the chair that would be really good thing to have, uh, going, especially if it, if it is of, of that importance, it would be good to have some more understanding on, on the Encompass programme. And I think it would be useful if we could get a written briefing in advance mm -hmm. and then we yeah, can, we can feed it into where it fits into forward, forward work. Thank you. Um, Sinead. Thank you, Chair, and thank you for your presentation. Um, I suppose I want to go back to the uh, breast and stroke proposals that are being presented to the Minister. Could you advise me um, 
how developed are they? Are they reports or are they recommendations? Do they include options for the minister to select from with a background read? Uh, I'd just like to know the nature of what is being presented to the minister and have they been completed at this stage on both topics? So, um, as part of any policy making, you have your consultation, then you'll have your consultation report, which will draw out the key points in terms of what people who were in favour, who wasn't, and, and any options <coughs> in relation to that. There are quite specific uh, recommendations, particularly on the breast assessment one. So, there will be a, a view in terms of people's acceptance to that, um, and basically for, for a minister to consider um, what people have said about the proposals that have been put forward to them. So, and you mentioned in your event, which um, was that, but you know, we talk about the outcomes and indicators about health inequalities, and we needed to be specific about that. And one of the um, huge issues that came up, certainly from the Mourns area, was access to services. And we have. It just seems odd to me that on one hand we're having conversations about the difficulties that exist in trying to recruit people to um, more rural areas or services that are outside or beyond Belfast. And yet when we do have services where we can actually have achieved that, that we are considering stripping those down to some degree or taking them closer to um, back into the Belfast remit. And, and I just think sometimes, you know, we're doing one thing this week and undoing it another. And I would just like an assurance that that regional access to services and the infrastructure or lack of infrastructure that exists is heavily weighted um, against the, the options and the, the clarity of communication that I certainly received is reflected in, in any report or recommendations brought to a minister. So I suppose what I would say is, in terms of the spectrum of health and social care, what we're trying to do is invest in communities, invest in primary care, invest in multidisciplinary team working, so that people can access more services without going outside of their local area. So there's an absolute commitment in delivering together to that. In terms of a, a regionalisation or a Belfast focus, what research would show is that where you can specialise for, spe for specialist services, where you can have centres of expertise, if you like, that deal with many numbers of people, then you have a more experienced workforce that are more satisfied in the job. Retention is a better, and actually people get a, a, a more improved service in terms of the quality and the timeliness. So it's a balance between those. Now, certainly in terms of where we cite future models, that will be up for consultation and we will use the reconfiguration criteria in terms of considering all of those options like access, like infrastructure, like people's ability to travel and we've done so a little bit of work on that or some work on that in terms of the breast assessment but more needs to be done. So before we cite or re redeploy uh, any service there will be a full consideration of, of the impact in line with any policy we need to consider the impact of the, the population. Thank you. Thank you. Um, in terms of the, the projects that are currently and, and the key deliverables that are currently being worked on, Sharon, how many projects are there currently in, in development or being rolled out? Chair, um, because of the nature of delivering <coughs> together, this sounds as if I'm going to fudge the issue, and maybe I am a little bit, because delivering together is huge. There are some centrally managed projects that are overseen by the Transformation Implementation Group, and we can absolutely give you a list of those. But the one thing that I would say is that transformation is also about enabling people in their local trust or in their local to, to, um, to make change, because it can't just be centrally driven. So I can give you quite a comprehensive list of what has oversight by the Transformation Implementation Group and what is currently being funded through the 200 million. But there are many, many other examples of a change and quality improvement um, and a transformation, if you like, that's not under the purview of the programme within the 200 million. So it's just to that caveat, but I can provide you with what's in uh, the 200 million. 
And I think what we would want then to do is to start, because this is obviously very, very high level in terms of, of detail, yeah. we'd want to start maybe looking at, at specific projects. And I know that there's 150 million has been outlined for, for next year. Rolling forward to 2026, what budgetary forecasts are being made for transformation in the following years? So roughly about 100 million, but because of the way we are bringing transformation forward in terms of co-production, those are very indicative costs. Um, and you know, we, we are putting a, a, a marker that we will definitely need additional money in and around 100 million. 100 million may not even be enough because if, if you recall, transformation is built on the premise that double running needs to be exist and we don't have enough money to run our business. At the minute, there's a 3% gap moving forward into next year in terms of what we need to run our business. So we have 100 million as a marker, but it, you know, it will become clearer as we start to co-produce co and understand where we're bringing uh, the transformation projects. For example, a decision on stroke and where, uh, you know, how that works moving forward. It's only then that you can really work through the cost associated with that. And that's 100 million per year? That's 100 million per year, as a conservative estimate. Okay. And in light of some of the issues we have already discussed in, in, in around the consultations, what lessons have been learned in terms of how co-production is done from this point forward? So I think we're always learning in terms of, of co-production. Um, you know, we, uh, we have a lead in terms of our chief nursing officer who has developed the guidance. We have invested uh, in um, enabling and building capacity and capability in co-production. But I think it's fair to say that um, co-production is, is difficult uh, as, a, it's, as, a, as, a, as a way of working. It takes time. Um, it takes people to absolutely listen. It takes proper engagement, not lip service. Um, and it takes you know, a, a bit of time for, for all of us as a system um, to work in a different way. Um, I think there is an absolute, um, a, not ambition, um, it's, it's more than that. We really do want to co-produce services. We want to, to listen and we want to respond accordingly because we know that unless we do that, things will start to unravel and we have no option but to make change that will be sustainable in the future. So um, I think I would say there, there are lessons to be learned now and I suspect if I was back in front of you next year I'd be saying there are more lessons to be learned um, but, but our ambition is to get there. Um, and this is I suppose, the final one from me. We have a few minutes if members want to, to come in on anything else. but. Um, the workforce issues is coming up time and time again with 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 stabilising the service as never mind transforming it. There's constant workforce issues, and we're all aware, I suppose, of, of the headline figure around nursing shortages. But there are lots of other uh, staff. So part of the workforce issue is to make sure that nurses are working to the top of their experience and ability and all of that. <coughs> that they're not, or social workers for that matter. And I, I'll declare an interest as having previously worked as a social worker myself, and my, my wife is a nurse, but. There are all a lot of other support staff in terms of so in terms of the workforce strategy, what are the, the detailed breakdowns of the staff grades or staff occupations that are missing in the system across I think it's seven thousand posts at this point in time? So I think you're getting a briefing on the workforce strategy next week, yeah. is it? Um, I don't have that uh, detail available to me, um, but I think it's fair to say there's quite a significant piece of work that's been done against each discipline to understand what are the gaps, what's the future uh, um, requirement, but also to start to consider, I think I mentioned earlier, about new roles coming into play and the impact of those roles, allowing people to work at the very top uh, of their grade and starting to change, um, you know, just the, the way um, the way we deliver the services. So um, I'm hoping that the presentation next week will give you the detail that you need on that chair. Okay. And the 1,600 that are employed in transformation projects, are, are those new roles? Are those people who are working on transformation or who are delivering transformation in, in the frontline services? That will be a mixture of people because what we said was for transformation we need to stabilise, <coughs> reconfigure and then transform. Many of those will be in stabilisation, so we funded uh, waiting list initiatives through the Transformation Fund. Um, that may be new people coming on board to deliver services. Um, in the main, um, we have used um, 
there's not that many people unemployed in health and social care, so probably people have not probably people have been redeployed from elsewhere, applied for jobs under transformation, and I think that's part of our challenge now. The transformation money comes to a drop dead end at the 31st of March. People have moved into these new roles, and it is an uncertain time for them. We need to evaluate those uh, new initiatives to see whether they need to continue. But in the main, most of them will uh, are showing that they are delivering what they said they would and will need to continue. And we have a real challenge in terms of funding those posts moving forward. Okay. Thank you. Well, listen. Thank you for your presentation and your and your responses. I think, and similar to some of the other issues we, we've come across, we will want to sort of drill down into some more of the detail, and, and we appreciate that you will be coming back to us with some information. But thank you for your assistance today, and uh, on behalf of the committee, thank you very much. Thanks very much. Okay, members. Um, we are now moving into the, uh, a number of statutory regulations, and I refer members to pages 26 to pages 40 of the pack, and in particular SR 2020 forward slash 16, the Food Safety Information and Compositional Requirements Amendment Regulations, NA 2020. This SR provides for enforcement of specific requirements for food for special medical purposes for infants and for infant formula and follow-on formula. The committee considered and approved the SL1 policy document for this rule at its meeting on 30th of January 2020. There have been no changes to the policy content since the SL1 was submitted to the committee and the examiner of statutory rules has no issues to raise. Have members any issues they wish to raise in connection with the statutory rules? If not, can I ask members to agree formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020 forward slash 16, the Food Safety, Information and Compositional Requirements Amendment Regulations, NA 2020, and has no objection to the rule. Are we agreed? Agreed. agreed. Number eight then, SL1, uh, the Healthy Start Scheme and Daycare Food Scheme Amendment Regulations, NA 2020, and this is an SL1. <coughs> I refer members to pages 42 to 44 of the pack. Can I advise members that the Department is proposing to make a statutory rule to make provision for the digitisation of the Healthy Start scheme. This would allow but not require applicants to apply online and is expected to increase uptake. The order will, be, will come into operation in April 2020 and is subject to negative resolution. Can I propose, members, that we write to the Department to inquire what awareness raising initiatives are planned in relation to this scheme, and if not, to suggest that uh, that be considered? I think there's no point in. I think it's welcome that, that access to schemes is being widened out to, to people, but I think if that's not accompanied by a public awareness, it may not. So, would members be content that we write to them in relation to that? Yeah, we can Thank you. Um, Are members content that the department makes the statutory rule? Are we agreed? So we're then on to the provision of health services, not ordinarily amendment, revocation regulations, NA 2020. I refer members to pages 46 to 50 of the pack and to pages 53 to 59 of the table papers which includes a letter from the Minister and a copy of the SR which was laid on Monday. This is to revoke SR 2019 forward slash 42, which we had prayed to and all. Um, as I indicated last week's meeting, I updated the Business Committee that the Committee's motion was not required in the event that the Department itself took steps to revoke the regulation. There is therefore no need for us to respond to the SL1, our members content to note. Yes. We do need to take a view on the revocation regulations. Have members any issues they wish to raise in relation to the revocation regulations? I will then put the question formally that the Committee for Health has considered SR 2020-19, the provision of health services not ordinarily, amendment revocation regulations. NA 2020 and, subject to the examiner of statutory rules report, has no objection to the rule. 
I would also suggest that we acknowledge the Minister's letter and thank him for taking steps to address our concerns. Are we content? Very content. Yep. <clears throat> Agreed. So, turning to correspondence then, members, can I refer you to pages 51 to 72 of the pack and to the table papers? There are seven items of correspondence in the pack and one in table papers at pages 61 to 65. Can I draw members' attention to several of the items? Uh, item 10.3 at pages 62 to 63 of the pack. That's a request from Community Pharmacy NA requesting an opportunity to brief the committee on the current crisis in Community Pharmacy. Um, are members content that we schedule a briefing with Community Pharmacy as part of the committee's consideration of primary care and multidisciplinary teams? Yeah. Yeah. I think we have, we have had evidence earlier from VMA about the success, but there's no doubt that then there's a similar pool of people from which pharmacists are being employed. Are members otherwise content with the proposed actions as noted in the correspondence memo at pages 52 to 53 uh, in table papers? Members content with that? Thank you. Um, forward work program then, can I refer you all to pages 74 to 75 of the pack? Are members content to note the forward work programme? Content. Yep. Noted. And do members have any other business? Jerry. Chair, yourself, alongside two other members, uh, met with some of the neurology recall patients on Monday this week, mm -hmm. uh, and that asked us that there is, I think, uh, their frustration that the, the minister is refusing to. And to meet them, so um, I would like to just share that with the committee and, and propose, if we can, that we contact the minister and ask him to, to meet some of those patients, if that's okay. Members content with that? Yeah. 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 Uh -huh. yeah. Okay, great. Thanks, sir. Okay, any other business members? Just Hello. on that, uh, the neurology uh, inquiry, I, I've been receiving correspondence from a gentleman, I'm sure maybe you all have, same gentleman. Uh, whose mother had uh, died whilst under the care of the, the uh, neurologist uh, in question, uh, and he feels that the department have been dragging their heels. That you know that the permanent secretary had given certain assurances about when th that part of the inquiry would be would be commenced. That that would be patients who had died whilst under the care of, of Mr. Watt, Dr. Watt. Um, so I, I note from la last week that the, I mean, I'm only getting up to date now with everything, Chair, but the, that we have invited, I think, the independent chair of the inquiry. So, you know, I'm just raising it today on the record, but we will have the opportunity to ask direct questions, obviously, of the independent chair of, of, the, of the timelines involved. Yeah. The, the, the chair had indicated that he was happy to come and brief the committee in terms of processes and timelines, and we have agreed to him coming on, on that basis. We have also are, are currently in the process of working to see how we can also have RQIA come to brief us on the various strands, including the strand that, that the member refers to. So I think both of those things should shed some light upon the issues, but we would be keen to hear from RQIA in relation to that strand of the inquiry also. I appreciate those comments. Thank you. Okay. Chair, I'm just wondering, um, because I suppose we've all had correspondence um, and we have the ability within the committee to have some closed sessions, I wonder is there even the opportunity to some of the more vocal and, and confident um, patients, even if they could come in closed session and give us an understanding of their experience? Yeah, I don't know what members think. Yeah. Would it uh, preempt the work of the inquiry uh, if we were to do that? Um, potentially, the other the other issue is that the committee takes a wider view of all of these issues. So, I suppose where, where issues are, although neurology is certainly a, a broadly based one, there are some of the other issues that are more constituency based. I, I, I suppose the inquiry at the minute is an inquisitorial inquiry, and they will be putting forward recommendations in terms of procedures for changes going forward. The minister this week ruled out having a full public inquiry, mm -hmm. which, if that. Um, individual came or a person came that could be prejudicial but at the minute it's sitting as an inquisitorial inquiry and I don't see that there'd be any conflict there. Well would members be content maybe we have a discussion on this at our planning day to see how we deal with with what we we're all aware of a range of maybe yeah. maybe we could discuss that plan day. Yeah. Members happy enough for that? Yeah sure because I do think it's particularly a sensitive issue and mm. what I'm conscious of is that 
while there are some people very willing, like you say, and able to speak and communicate, that's one part of the story. And there's equally um, maybe a lot of patients who don't feel that they're part of a, a, a group, but they have a story to tell. And we could end up um, with an unfair balance of the picture. So yes, I think we'd need to measure it Okay. okay. Yeah. I think I think that's a fair a fairly useful thing for us to. We mm -hmm. will have a, a I think a focused discussion on that, as to how we handle that in yeah. general, in, in particular and in general moving yeah. forward. So thank you for that, members. The date, time, and place of the next meeting is the twenty seventh of February, two thousand twenty, here in the Senate Chamber. Thank you, members, for your attendance. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. This is the Northern Ireland Assembly Senate Chamber program signed.